Hello. This is the second in a series of three short presentations about control over wireless using the ISA 100.11a standard. I am Jay Werb, Technical Director of the ISA 100 Wireless Compliance Institute. The goal of these presentations is to explain how systems based on the ISA 100 standard can be used for control. This presentation focuses on requirements for wireless control in ISA 100 systems. Let's start with a very simple slide that I like to show whenever we discuss control over wireless. This slide makes a very simple but important point. We show two devices, often within radio proximity of each other. One device publishes data to the other device at one second intervals, and the other device receives the signal and does something useful with the information. This is a fundamental configuration for control. So, how should we think about a system that supports this and other control configurations? The next few slides summarize the ISA 100 view of control. ISA 100 was designed to cover a wide range of applications, summarized in the standard as applications 0 through 5. The ISA 100 usage classes are shown in this slide. The most critical application class is emergency action, numbered zero, shown at the top of the chart. The least critical application class is logging, numbered five, shown at the bottom of the chart. In this presentation series, we will focus on control applications, classes one, two, and three. Class one is closed loop regulatory control. Class two is closed loop supervisory control and class three is open loop control. This slide summarizes the control application example that you can find described in the ISA 100.11a standard itself. Let's start with control class three. The open loop control examples in the standard all involve the user in the loop. An operator manually initiates a flare and watches the flare. A guard remotely opens the security gate. An operator performs a manual pump or valve adjustment. Moving up to control class two, we have closed loop supervisory control. These are usually non-critical. Examples include low frequency cascade loops, multivariate controls, and optimizers. At the top of the ISA 100.11a control hierarchy, we have control class one. The standard describes direct control of primary actuators, such as where a host connection is available on demand 99.99% .99 of the time or more, with link outages of more than a half second in intolerable, and with demand rates once every four seconds. High frequency cascades are also mentioned. On this slide, we suggest that something on the order of one second latency end-to-end -end, should be the basic performance reference for control. Some applications can manage with less performance, and a few may need more. But we have found that one second latency covers a reasonable, a reasonable range of applications without involving painful user trade-offs. For example, consider human-in-the-loop control application, shown here as a person pressing a button. Normally, users want to see some feedback from their actions. It is well known that when a response time exceeds about two seconds, the user's attention will start to drift. So we suggest one to two seconds, end to end, as a reasonable target for human in the loop control. As another example, consider automated control, shown here as a pressure sensor feeding data to a valve controller. Generally, the scan period should be some fraction of the lag in the process response. We give a value of 5% as a rough rule of thumb, with a plus or minus to indicate that the actual value depends on the application. In practice, this kind of thinking leads, um, excuse me, where do we get the value of 5%? Basically, it's a guideline that I've seen used in actual applications. For example, 
to prevent excessive valve activity in the presence of higher frequency noise, you might reasonably make the period between scans less than one-tenth of the dead time, or one-twentieth of the lag in the process response. In practice, that kind of thinking tends to result in numbers in the range of 5% shown on the slide. How does this map to actual systems? When you look at actual ISA 100 solutions and systems intended for control, you keep seeing scan rates and latencies on the order of one second, with system architectures designed to support that. You might notice that these reference performance parameters are not downgraded just because it's wireless. That's the point, of course. Control is control, however the message is transmitted. When we designed ISA 100, we had control very much in mind and worked from the ground up to make sure it would meet reasonable user expectations for control. You'll find that DNA in actual ISA 100 products. For example, one commonly asked question is, do we need to actually transmit data every scan, even if the data hasn't changed? The answer, of course, depends on the application. But at the end of the day, control systems go into a failure state when data is uncertain. For this reason, you'll find that most ISA 100 control solutions are optimized to transmit data each interval. In this table, we identify five key requirements for wireless control. First, we've already discussed sampling rates and latency. For control, you need high confidence that messages will be transmitted on time. We list one to two second latency as a baseline target for control to support human-machine interaction. The ISA 100 standard was designed to support reporting rates of four times per second or possibly more in, in meticulously engineered installations. Second, if your network can't be architected for the performance you need, the rest of this list doesn't matter. The designers of ISA 100 believe that whenever control is involved, the network needs to be carefully engineered as an extension of a mature and scalable IP backbone. This bias is clear in the standard, and it's also clear in ISA 100 products. Third, true mesh networking is a practical requirement for control. For time-critical control applications, it might not be acceptable to wait for a message to travel all the way to a controller and then all the way back again wirelessly. For those network configurations, control needs to involve a simple and direct wireless connection between devices. These connections need to keep running even if the mesh network operation is temporarily interrupted. This kind of peer-to-peer -peer support also implies that control logic runs in the devices themselves. Notice that we mentioned battery life under mesh networking and use the word deterministic. Devices used for control tend to use a lot of energy and network resources. It's essential that these devices operate for a well-defined lifetime without maintenance and without a lot of caveats about the network. Just as important, the existence of these control devices on the network should not create system-wide maintenance problems by running down the batteries of other devices on the network. Fourth and fifth, Reliability and security are listed as separate requirements. The actual technical solutions are generally integrated as they are in ISA 100.11a. Especially in control, deterministic on-time message delivery is essential. Wireless communication has an unavoidable statistical component, but it is essential that every effort be made to rig the odds using deterministic techniques. And of course, you need high confidence that your data has not been garbled or hacked. This short presentation was the second in a series of three. The first presentation covered some use cases. The second presentation discussed ISA 100 requirements for control. And the third presentation will explore ISA 100 network architectures for control. Thank you for joining us and have a great day.